My name is Laird Klingler. I'm a librarian with the Cornish Historical Society, and we're here uh, to interview Marilyn Bourne uh, at her home on Bill Village Road. The date is uh, October 2nd. Billy Sharp will be doing the filming. Uh, Marilyn, thank you for inviting us uh, into your home. Uh, before we begin with your uh, personal information, um, I'd like you to tell us a bit about the house and the location here in Mill Village. Certainly. So the house that I'm living in now was built in 1840 by Obed and Cynthia Powers. And Cynthia Powers was a Cummings, and her great-grandfather lived directly across the street. And after his death, um, her brother inherited that property, and she inherited land opposite that property. So I think she inherited the land in about 1839, and if you look at the tax card, by 1840 this house existed. And her husband was from Plainfield, just across the line, and he owned a small dry goods store. I don't know if he did that business here in Cornish, I haven't been able to de determine that, but um, I don't believe they were farmers, they were retailers. She sold the house probably around 18, late 1880s. She moved in with her, one of her daughters, and this property was sold. And the next people to move in it was the Bartlett family, Clayton Bartlett and his wife. And then, so if that was about 1890, Clayton Bartlett had a son, Raymond, who was born in this house. And a, about 10 years later, a daughter, Dorothy, she married someone from Springfield, Vermont. And Raymond stayed in the house, inherited the house, and owned the house until about 1974 or 5. And then, by chance, another family with the last name of Powers, but completely unrelated. Unrelated. Right, Don mm -hmm. and Sandy Powers bought this house, and then they opened the Cornish Flat General Store, which was Powers Country Store at the time. And they held the house for about 20 years, and then in, I think it was 97, 19, yeah, about 1997, I bought it from Sa Sandy and Don, who had moved to the south. Um, I purchased it from them, and so I've been here for about 20 years now. Now you said uh, this was a farm. It was a farm. When the Bartlett's purchased it, it became a dairy farm. And I was just able to contact the grandchild of Clayton Bartlett, who is a little bit older than I am, but he remembered this house very well from the 1950s, 40s and 50s. Mm. And he sent me some photographs of the farm, and he drew a map to show me where all the outbuildings were and label what they were. So there was a shed at the back end of this house at one time, and it was a fairly good-sized shed. I thought it was a tractor shed. It turns out it was for the horses, and there's a photograph of Raymond Bartlett holding the two horses in front of the shed. So I start to get educated about... We'd like to have a copy of that for the uh, store. Oh, I, could, I can I certainly can. give you that. But yeah. you also mentioned that the road was different at that time. Yes, the road certainly, probably until the 1920s. I'm not certain when Townhouse shaped, shifted its shape, but Townhouse came, it wasn't called Townhouse, but it came through Mill Village. So the, it bypasses Mill Village now, and now you have Mill Village Road. But prior to the extension going behind here on the other side of the brook, it came over the covered bridge, went through the village, and crossed another bridge to continue on into Windsor. And it was referred to as the highway to Windsor. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay, now let's start with your personal information. Sure. May we start with uh, where and when you were born? Sure. I was born at uh, the Lying In Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, October 20th, 1946. 26. Um, well, tell us about your childhood. Tell us about growing up. Um, I lived in Greenville. My, <laughs> I had a family that moved a lot. So when I was born, I went home to Greenville. My mother and father, which was unusual at the time, divorced when I was about four years old. And my mother and my two siblings, an older sister and a younger sister, moved to my grandparents' house on Congdon Street in Providence, Rhode Island. My grandfather was head of the math department at Brown University. And so my early recollections are playing in the park. It's Roger Williams Park with a big statue of Roger Williams with his hand out like this over <laughs> the city. Mm -hmm. And we played in and around the statue with the neighborhood kids. 
We lived there till I was probably six years old. My mother remarried and we moved to Barrington. And Barrington. Barrington, Rhode Island, right? It's about 15 minutes from Providence. And that's where the bulk of my youth was spent. I went to up to 10th grade there. Then we moved to Newport, Rhode Island. I did two years of school in Newport, but the house in Barrington hadn't sold. So we moved back to Barrington for my senior year. So I made new friends, but couldn't graduate with them, but ended up graduating with friends that I had had for many years in Barrington and then back to Newport. Mention a little bit also, I'm, because of my background, I'm interested in your missionary background. Yes. Well, my grandfather ended up in Providence because his father graduated from Brown University and my grandfather's grandfather also graduated from Brown. But my great-grandfather, after graduating, Brown was a seminary school at the time, and my great-grandfather became a Baptist missionary, and his mission was Yokohama, Japan. So they sailed to Yokohama. And what date about? about? That would be about 18, late 1870s, hmm. early, mid-1870s, because my grandfather was born in Yokohama in 1888, and he was one of 10 children. But by the time he was 14, he sailed back to the west coast of the United States by cattle ship is what I'm told. And he said it was pretty smelly, but it was an inexpensive ticket to come across the Pacific. And then a train from San Francisco to Philadelphia, which is where the rest of his family was, but then left Philadelphia to come to Providence to finish schooling, formal schooling, and then moved on to Brown University. Did the missionaries stay in, in They Japan? stayed, yes. It's, it's strange when you hear the story. So from the time my grandfather was 14 till the time he, his father died, and he was young, I think it was tuberculosis, his father died from tuberculosis in Yokohama. Hmm. My grandfather had only seen him two other times, and I think my grandfather was around 22 when his father died. Interesting. Well, let's pick you up then from high school. Sure. Your activities then. So from high school, um, I started college, and as many people do, uh, fell in love, got married, stopped my education, had children. My husband continued on with his education. He graduated from University of Rhode Island, and that would have been in 1971. And by that time, we had two children, and the youngest was just a year old, and we ended up moving trying to decide where to raise a family. He was from New York, and I, uh, being from Rhode Island, I loved it, especially down by the ocean, but I had a problem with winters, because when you're by the ocean in the wintertime, the weather is brutal. It's a sharp, biting cold. There's no snow, it melts, so there's very little for you to do. So where's there a place where there's a dry winter where you could actually have snow? It was also the time that folks our age we're thinking about returning to the way our grandparents lived, going back to farming, uh, simpler life. And my mother found out about this farm in Cornish and let us know about it. So we ended up moving to Cornish and uh, living on what's now Deming Road. And it was a 200 acre farm at the time with a pond, views, a barn, so we did everything. We got horses, we got cows and chickens, we raised our own pigs, we had big gardens. A little bit like the back to the land movement? Yes, yes. but with a job, with a full-time, Eddie had a full-time job, which allowed me to stay at home with the children. And in 1974, we had our third child, um, a little girl, and I was a stay-at-home mom milking cows, <laughs> <laughs> gathering eggs, Tending to the garden. Did you, did you milk by hand? Or? Oh, absolutely. Did you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sally Wellborn taught me how to milk. I bought my first cow from Sally. She wanted, the, she needed um, a maple syrup because she was canning berries. So she said she would trade her cow for two or three gallons of maple syrup. And we had a sugar house and we had learned how to make maple syrup. We actually did a pretty good job. This is all on Deming Road. All on Deming Road. Because there was this, one of the older uh, sugar houses in town was on Deming Road. That farm was 1790. That's when that farm was established. So there were a lot of, there was a wonderful smokehouse that was from the 1790s. And we made bacon and ham and mm -hmm. sausage, smoked it in the smokehouse. So I got a cow and uh, learned to milk. 
learned to make cheese. Making butter was easy. Making cheese took a little more effort. Um, and we, uh, it, was a, it was an idyllic life. The kids ate well. They understood about the birth of a little calf and how long it lived and how well it was treated. And that later how, how many on, cows did you have? I ended up having two. I had the cow that Sally sold me, and then I wanted a Jersey because I wanted more butterfat. Mm. So I got another cow, um, sold the first cow, purchased another cow. We had a number of calves that we raised, and they were for beef. Um, but we we did a good job of it. Yeah. You, uh, tell us about your children. You said you have three children? I do. Yes. So the first two were born in Rhode Island. Um, a little girl, Wendy, uh, she was born in 1967. Jason was born in 1970. And then up here, Molly was born in 1974. Do they live here in the area? Uh, they, they live um, one in, Middle, in Middlebury, Vermont. That's my oldest, Wendy. She and her husband live there and the children, are, she has two boys. My son, Jason, my second child, lives here in town and he has three children. And two of them are graduated from college and the youngest is just off to college. Oh, wow. They all went to Cornish school, by the way. All of my children went to Cornish school and half my grandchildren went to Cornish school. So I have a place in my heart for Cornish school. And then my third child, Molly, lives in um, Springfield, New Hampshire, and she has two children, two boys. Mm. And after my, my husband, Eddie, was killed in an accident in uh, 1977, a farming accident. And so I married seven years later and had a fourth child who also lives here in town, Christopher Chilton. And he has a little boy who is also going to Cornish school. Oh, yeah. So. That was a terrible tragedy, of course. Yeah. You know, yeah. For your, for Farming your accidents um, yeah. are more frequent than people realize. And it was while we were sugaring, a, a piece of equipment failed and he got a fatal injury from the machine. Then your life changed, of course, that you had to be a provider. Yes. And I had to decide if I wanted to stay. And I had a friend that I'd known since I was in junior high school who lived in St. Thomas. And I, several months after Eddie's death, I just needed to get away and think about what's life going to be like. And it was hard for me to stay here in town because everything I saw reminded me of the fact that Eddie's no longer there. And so my friend said, oh, just grab the kids, leave, change your life, come to St. Thomas. And it seemed pretty appealing at the time because it was very, very different. I wouldn't have to worry about winter. I wouldn't have to worry about shoveling snow or scraping ice or breaking ice for the animals in the barn. So I, I sold everything. I sold, I let all the animals go, sold the equipment, and in about uh, eight months, moved down to St. Thomas. I kept the farm because I wasn't sure if I was going to stay, but I rented it out, bought a house in the Caribbean, and it was a very different life, and it was great. At least it was, it was good for me. I'm not sure in the long run how good, how good it was for the children. I think it was confusing. It was tough for them to, it was tough anyway. It was tough all the way around. It's a really hard experience to go through. So after two years of living in what they call paradise, I decided, given that the educational system down there was not to the standards of education here in the States, that it would be in the kids' best interest to come back to the States. But the question was, where? Would I go back to Rhode Island? I thought about that. I still had a lot of friends there. Or maybe I'd go to Florida, where the weather was similar to the Caribbean. But I, I just... There was something about the culture um, of New England and my history there and the changing seasons. I did miss that in St. Thomas. So I ultimately decided I might as well go right back to Cornish. Mm. So that's where I ended up. Um, and the first house that I purchased when I returned, because I'd sold the farm maybe six months before I made this decision, I sold the farm to my sister and her husband. So I couldn't go back there. And I came back and thought, where am I going to live? I stayed with them for a little bit. And I ended up buying um, J.D. Salinger's old house on Lang Road. Not the one that he lived in for the last 30 years, but the one he, his wife, his first, second wife got after the divorce. And it was a great spot 
But the problem with that location is if your children are going to Cornish school, you're pretty far outside the center of town. So there's a lot of back and forth in the car. And my sister decided that she was going to subdivide some of the farmland up. So I actually ended up buying about 12 acres back from her. And I built a house on Deming Road at the back of the field behind the barns and the house. It was a beautiful spot, but after about 10 years, and I'd remarried in that interim, uh, Gary Chilton and I were remar I remarried to Gary. Gary had no children, so the child that we had together was his one and only. So um, that relationship ended. Um, we're good friends, but I don't think I, I'm good to be married anymore. I'm, I'm better off by myself. <laughs> So when I did that, I thought, now I've got a brand new house with a heavy tax burden because it was new. So in 97, I sold it and bought the house that I'm in now. The house here? Yes, here the, in Mill Village, 1840s house. And the interesting thing is that it's actually a house that Eddie and I looked at hmm. when we were here in town. We actually looked at this house. It was for sale at the time, but... It didn't win out, so it, it won out 30 years later. <laughs> so um, when you came back to uh, the, uh, Cornish, the, about in the early 70s, it would have been? We returned in 79. 79. Okay. Well, what about you when you first came to Cornish in terms of? In 71. 71. Yeah. I, I always like to ask people uh, their views of how the Upper Valley changed with the coming of the interstates. Right. So you would have been here pretty much when the interstates were finished. Then. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons the town was appealing because Eddie was a manufacturer's representative and so he was on the road um, frequently. So this access to 89 and 91 was very important for him within his territory, all of New England, mm -hmm. part of Canada, down to New York. So this was a great location given that access. Uh, but you're right, it was because we arrived shortly after those connections were made between 81 and um, 91 and, and uh, 89, the Upper Valley still was pretty sparse when it came to uh, stores. We couldn't shop for children's clothing here. There was literally no place to go. You could go to something like a five and 10 cent store. Uh, you could order through Sears catalog but to purchase home goods was difficult. I think when I moved here in the Upper Valley, there was a furniture store, there was um, a movie theater and a Sears. I don't think McDonald's had come in yet, but there wasn't very much when you went into West Lebanon, maybe three or four, a grocery store, a movie theater, a Sears, and Brown's Furniture. What about, what about the, you're close to Windsor? Would you go yes. to Windsor? Uh, there was a clothing store for, for adults in Windsor, um, the kind of clothing that you would get at a Hersh's, you know, outdoor stuff, heavy duty pants and jackets and woolen shirts, gloves, that sort of thing, more for men than even, even for women. But there was no, no store for children. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think there was a little uh, luncheonette on the main street. It's a place that JD used to go to all the time to get coffee and buy a newspaper. So you would get the newspaper and cards and you could sit at the counter. And, and But there wasn't, in fact, there were still some Victorian houses that now don't exist because there's a gas station and a laundromat there. We arrived just prior to them tearing those down and selling the property for commercial use. And when we moved here, um, maybe three years after we moved here, the hotel that lives that's in Windsor now, they were going to tear that down. Mm. And someone created a historic society to preserve it. Mm. And that's the reason it exists, but. Were the big plants still there on there? Cones and yes, Goodyear? Yes, Goodyear, uh, they were still operating. Cones was, I think Goodyear may have ceased to operate within a year or two of us arriving, but Cones was a big employer. So you did see the Upper Valley. Oh, absolutely. You know, when it was very prosperous in yes. terms of these towns. And when there were cornfields, all over West Lebanon. There were cornfields. Do you remember that? Where, yeah. where Kmart is, there were cornfields. Yeah. I remember when they burned the farmhouse down for a practice fire for the fire department, um, where, I'm trying to think who's there. Oh, where the Walmart store is. 
where the original farmhouse that owned all of that land was still standing. And that probably would have been 1981, and they burned it and then started to clear land. And it, it, it took a few years, but then all of a sudden, Walmart showed up. Okay. Now, uh, let's go back to the time. You're a widow, you have children, mm -hmm. so you have to be a provider. Yes. Um, tell us about your, your working career then. Well, I was fortunate in that I didn't have to work right away. And when, because Eddie had some funds and he had a good job and there's Social Security survivor benefits when, when a husband or a wife passes away and there are minor children. So that meant that for at least four or five years, I didn't have to work. Then when I was remarried, which would have been 1983, so I came back in 79 and 83, I remarried, and my husband, Gary, and his brother, Steve Fellows, who lives you here. You lose those benefits then, don't you? No, the children oh, still children. get them. Children. Right, they go to the children. Right. But um, Steve Fellows and Gary owned, purchased Art Bennett's sporting goods store in Hanover. So I started working that way. I decided, well, I'll become part of that. Uh, by the time my, Gary's and my child, Christopher, who was born in 84, by the time he was two, he would go to daycare and I would go to work. But I could shift my hours so that I could still take care of a preschooler. And when Chris went off to school, first grade, then I worked more hours. And after I was divorced, um, I went to work for Carol Reed, which was a clothing store for women. A pretty well-known clothing store. It doesn't exist in anymore. Hanover. In Hanover. Mm -hmm. Main Street in Hanover. And I just did that as a manager for a while. Then I, then Carol Reed closed. I went to work for another retailer. And I just got tired of retail. And about the time I got tired of retail, which would have been around 1996, I think it was 1996, I was looking for a different kind of job, more operations than day-to-day -day retail. And three different people, three different times, all unrelated, said to me when I was having the conversation, you should talk to the people that listen. Listen Community Service was a nonprofit um, with a main office in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And they had thrift stores, so I said, <laughs> I want to get away from retail, and I think I'm probably highly overqualified to do thrift store retail. It's just not anything I want. The third person to tell me to check out Listen was standing behind me in the grocery store, and I was talking to the person in front of me, a friend of mine. And the person behind me tapped me on the shoulder and said, I don't want you to think I was eavesdropping, but I couldn't help but hear the conversation. You need to call Listen. So it's like that proverbial, ding! Third. <laughs> when am I going to pay attention? Apparently yeah. the cosmos yeah. wants me to talk to the people that listen. So I went home and I made a phone call. And the executive director at the time, Hilda Ojibwe, said, well, it's sort of late for you to be calling. We've had the ad out for a while and we're about to close out the search. And I said, well, I'm not even certain it's a job I want. I'm not really looking for retail, but why don't I tell you very quickly my background? So I did. And she said, oh, would you be willing to come in and chat? So because I had extensive retail management, I went in and talked with her, and when I understood what the job was, it wasn't being, it wasn't running a store, it was operations for retail altogether. They had three stores at the time. So then I, she called me back, and I sat down with board members, and I had time to really think about what I could provide for Listen. And I said, well, I can take you out of the 18th century, bring you into the 20th century, uh, I can teach people customer service and regular retail routines because I've been to some of the stores and you know, I wasn't that impressed. And I, I think you're probably not realizing the benefit of the product. I could generate greater sales. If I generate greater sales and if I give training to your staff, two things will happen. The higher revenues will fund deeper the services that you have now. You can expand those services. But I can also give people an opportunity, if they can't move up, to move out because I can give them skills they don't have that retailers are looking for. And I could keep all of this in-house. So working for retailers where the headquarters are Arkansas, um, I had sp spoken to Walmart and they thought about managing the new store that was being built in Claremont. 
But that money then leaves the community. I'd rather work for an agency where everything stays in the community and you're benefiting your neighborhood. Tell us what Listen does. So Listen is a private nonprofit that provides crisis and family services to low-income families and individuals. Things like fuel assistance, uh, rent assistance, food pantry. We do community dinners. Now they do it six nights a week. At the time we were doing it five. Uh, there were youth programs. We send two to three hundred kids a summer to a summer camp experience. We pay the tuition and they choose the camp. We worked with about 40 different camps. Um, holiday baskets, there are a, a lot of programs. Many of the programs that Listen provides are programs that the government is defunding. And Listen doesn't take any government funds, so that allows Listen to go where the need is. We don't have to follow their guidelines. Poverty guidelines in this country are broken. I, I sound like a I sound like another spokesperson for Listen. I'm retired now, but I believe very strongly in what they did, what they're doing. And so I'm very proud of the 20 years that I spent with Listen. 20 years? 20 years. And 15 of those years were as the executive director. And that's interesting. No government funding. None. No government funding. You must have spent a lot of time raising money then. Yes, I did. There's an annual appeal. Um, what I spent a lot of time doing was growing the stores and managing the stores and teaching people how to price, how to merchandise, how to market. So the stores have to provide two services. The stores have to be a source of revenue to fund programs that are always growing. The need is always growing. And at the same time, they have to be a resource for low-income low families. So you can't raise funds from the stores by raising the prices exorbitantly. You have to keep the prices reasonable. And generally, it's about 10% of regular retail. I also expanded the stores by putting a furniture store in. No one had done that before. And they didn't think there was money in it. And I said, well, there's a great deal of money in used furniture. Tell, tell us, a, well, where are the stores? So there, is a, there are two stores in uh, White River right now. One um, was on Route 5, it was the old 25,000 Gifts and Woolens, so it was a souvenir shop for decades. Uh, we purchased that to put furniture in. Then we purchased a piece of property uh, right along the Connecticut and White River. It's called River Point Plaza. They're now calling it the Bourne Center, which is oh, okay. very, very, very oh, generous okay. of very them. Nice. But it was River Point Plaza, and I oversaw the expansion and reconstruction on that site, so we have a brand new building that houses our community dinner program, our teen life skills center, and a very large and modern uh, thrift store, retail store. Mm -hmm. And then there are there's a store in Lebanon where the original building sits on Hanover Street, 60 Hanover Street, and then in Canaan, just around the corner from Mascoma Regional High School, is our fourth store. Where are the offices that you headquarters? The offices are in Lebanon, where they've always been, 60 Hanover Street. Mm -hmm. I see, I see, yeah. You know, um, there's, there's so much affluence in the Upper Valley, but there are people in need, and I, I think, oh, I think uh, people with money often forget that. You know, right, so, yeah. and we're very fortunate. Yeah. The Upper Valley, uh, there are two communities, three communities, between Lebanon, Hanover, and Norwich, we get a great deal of very good merchandise to resell, hmm. whether it's furniture, clothing, or household goods. And I think we've done a good job of getting the public to understand that you could throw it away, which is a shame, or you could just reuse it, which is what we want to do. It's more green, think green. Um, bring it to listen, and we will turn it into dollars that provide programs for folks who can't afford to go out and buy a new couch, who can't afford even to buy a new set of dishes, but they can certainly get what they need at Listen. And Listen has a program, a voucher program. If you are really in, in trouble, let's say you've been homeless and now you're getting your first apartment and you have two children, um, we will give you the basics. We will give you beds for your family. We'll give you a kitchen table and chairs. We don't want people sleeping on the floor or eating on the floor. And we'll give you the dishes that you need so you can get started. I think it's accurate to say that you revitalize the, the listen operation. I like to know. think too. When I arrived, they were generating 
from three stores, they were generating about $600,000 a year. When I left, there were four stores, and the revenues coming in were closer to a million eight hundred thousand. Oh. So, I like to think that I left them in better shape oh, than I, I found I, them. I would say so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Let's move now to your um, volunteer activities. Um, you know, in Cornish, uh, you've been very active. Um, let's start with the uh, with your school with, with the school. Of course, as a mother first. Um, I'd like to save the whole issue of declining enrollment for later sure. in the conversation, but, but tell us uh, your involvement with the schools here in Cornish. Well, my oldest child, uh, Wendy, was five when we moved to Cornish in 1971, and the next year uh, she went off to first grade. So I became very involved, and then two years later, Jason went off to first grade. By that time, I was part of the PTA. It was the PTA at the time. Now it's parent-teacher organization. I think they've actually changed the name yet again, but we stopped being PTA, we became PTO. So I was a member, and then I was the secretary, and then I became the vice chair. Um, I got very involved in the Cornish Fair because it helped fund programs for the school. And when that happened, I became a member of the Cornish Fair Association, I was on the, the board. Hmm. Um, the school was quite a bit smaller, we didn't have the addition, and it was jam-packed. It was a full school. It was a, a great school. Uh, it's how I became friendly with more people. When I first moved to town, I didn't know that many people. As soon as your child goes off to school, then you meet other parents with children the same age, and I found that there were a lot of parents the same age as me and Eddie, with children about the same age, and we expanded our network of friends. So it was a great way to become connected um, within the town. And I experienced school district meeting. That was new to me. I'd never seen anything like it. Town meeting, the same thing. What? You get to stand up and speak? <laughs> and that took courage. I think the first time I ever stood up at a school district meeting, my voice was probably quavering all over the place. And I was really, I probably spoke a mile a minute, the way so many people do. And then after a while, you realize no one's going to yell at you. Your thoughts are your thoughts, and you're allowed to express them. And nobody tells you to sit down and be quiet, which was quite civil. And so I really became interested in the way the town operates, because I never saw any of that where I grew up. Um, now, you've also held elective office. Yes. Yes. Uh, were you on the school board? No, I was, no, no, but, I was never on the school you, board. You've been secretary, though, haven't you? Of the PTA. Okay, no, of not the, of, the, of the school board. Not of the school board, no. Sorry. I was interested in the school board, but we had wonderful school board members um, for a, a, a good 20, 30 year run. We had great school board members. When I first moved into town, before my kids went off to school, I heard a lot of rumbling that there were that the school board was anti-education or anti-school, always wanted to cut the budget. And so I became interested in what was going on, and that's why going to school board meetings was important. But there were people who had been in town a little bit longer than I had been who were interested in um, supporting the school and ran for office. So I never felt the need to run for the school board because we had highly qualified people doing the job. So your involvement was primarily as a parent? As yeah. a parent, absolutely, and volunteering to do things at school. Um, when I was pregnant with my fourth child, I volunteered to teach art because art had been removed due to cost savings. Art had been removed from the school program and I thought that was a shame and at that time I wasn't working. So I, until I had uh, Christopher, I would come to school twice a week and teach art, lower wing, upper wing. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, I dabble in it, and but I, I knew enough to be able to um, instruct kids. I remembered the basics from high school. Mm -hmm. I, I took art all four years in high school, and I thought about going to art school mm -hmm. after I graduated, but my parents said, you'll never make money as an artist, so we are not funding art school <laughs> for you. Right. But I was able to use what I, <clears throat> what I knew, what I had gained mm -hmm. uh, with the kids, and they enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it. What was your involvement with the fair? Um, because the fair would help fund the school, um, the PTO at that time would set up a booth on the fairgrounds and sell lemonade. One year I made chili and I would design the, the motif. 
the fair would have a theme, as they still do, but many town organizations were allowed to have booths on the fairway, and then we had to decorate them so that they fit the theme. And I remember one year was uh, down on the farm Mexican style, something like that. So I had made this big mural of a gentleman sitting under a saguaro cactus with a donkey, and they had the Mexican hats on. And I think that year we ended up doing chili for the food that we were going to sell, and it ended up to be a very cool a fair weekend and the chili sold out. It was wonderful. But when I became a member of the fair association, became a fair director, I asked them what was happening at the gate. They were allowing uh, the Lady Elks from Claremont to run the gates. And I found out that the Lady Elks got a percentage, it's a small percentage, but they got a percentage of the take at the gate. And I said, well, wait a minute. I think that's wonderful for Claremont, but this is a Cornish organization and Cornish volunteers help run it. So why can't the PTA do it? And they said, well, the PTA never asked to do it. I said, I don't think the PTA understood that there was a percentage to be made. So if I go back and talk to the PTA and they want the gate, will you give them the gate? And they said, sure. And that was what, I don't know, 25 years ago? And they've yeah, been doing yeah. it ever since. So I was really glad that I made that connection between those two organizations because it's a, you make much more money and then the PTA doesn't have to do 10 or 20. You know, I didn't realize that. Maybe other people didn't. Is that still the case now? Would yeah. you go, go to pay your admission? Yeah, a percentage of that goes to the PTA or the PTO. Right. And then they use it to support the students by bringing in programs, by buying books. They will bring in a, a performance crew, maybe out of the Hopkins Center, and pay for it through those funds. Hmm. So when you go to the fair, just keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. All right, now, now let's move you on the select board. For yes. Um, tell us of your uh, involvement with the Cornish government. Uh, I think it was 2004. And... Um, I'm trying to think. The name escapes me and it shouldn't. Bob Maslin was retiring as selectman. Bob called me up and we knew one another a little bit. I knew his sons better, but Bob called up and said, Marilyn, Bob Maslin here. I'm not going to run for office this year. I think it's time for a woman. There had never been a female. Was that right? So, yeah, I was the first. So I said, oh, gee, I don't know. There are some things I'd like to see change in the office a little bit. And so, okay, I'll think about it. And actually, Dale Rook called me up and said, I understand from Bob, he's asked you to run for a selectman. You run, I'll pay the $1 filing fee. I said, I think I can afford the filing fee, <laughs> Dale. That's not going to be a problem. I just have to think about the commitment because it's, you know, two days a week and three days a week and um, several hours. And I think it's, it's going to take up a lot of time. And I was working at the time. But I was, at that time, executive director of LISTEN. And I said to the board of directors, I've been asked to run for office in my town. And there, were, there was one or two members of the board who said, we don't want you to be distracted. We don't want you to do that. But a very influential member said, that's ridiculous. She can really benefit LISTEN. If she's a member of the select board and the executive director, that can help us in a lot of different ways because it expands her connections in the community. So they said, sure, and that allowed me to devote the time because there were mornings where I would have to be in the selectman's office till about noontime. Yeah, how, how long were you on the select board? Um, I did nine years nine as years. a select person, okay. yeah, yeah. And it was- Significant uh, amount of time. Si oh. Significant amount of time, and I learned a lot. I knew a lot, but I learned a lot more. And I talked to Mike Itzavich probably about six months before he passed away, former selectman, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just a histo historic figure in town here because he did both jobs. He was a selectman and he was a school board member at the same time. Mm -hmm. So he was highly committed to the shepherding the town. So I talked to him about that. And I talked to him about shepherding the town and, and what the job was. It's an administrative job, but every now and then, it gets a little political. And so my focus was to keep politics out of it and to keep personalities out of it. If someone comes in and you don't like them, they get treated the same as anybody. You treat them like your best friend, right? So there are no favorites. Mm -hmm. So that was my perspective when I went in because I think there, there were times when that would happen and that's what I was hearing and that's why people asked me to run. 
I said, yeah, it's an administrative position. I know how to do that. Just take a look at the rules and regulations that town has put upon itself and you ensure that those are administered appropriately. And when I was talking to Mike about it, I said, you know, it's a fascinating business and it's fascinating to watch the people who come in and to listen <laughs> to them and to see how everyone functions. Sometimes you wish you didn't know, right? Sometimes you, you learn more about people than you wish you had known before. But Mike, Mike laughed when I said that, but he said, yes, that's exactly right. It is fascinating. <laughs> so, well, you know, in any uh, political career, there are um, achievements and disappointments. Um, what would be some of the achievements you felt during that period? That's a good question. I think just making it through day to day and um, helping people to work cooperative, cooperatively is an achievement. But some of the things that really were to show up. Um, oh, one of the things that I did, and it comes from working for Listen, is that I understood that the road crew would pick up downed limbs and downed trees, cut it up and take it home. And I guess that's a benefit for the road crew, but I thought if trees are falling down in a windstorm and the landowner doesn't want the tree because you first have to ask the landowner if, if they want the wood or not, um, I think the better idea would be for us, since we're paying the crew to do this, to take it to the recycling center. So I recommended that to the selectmen. I said, I think we have to have a policy where when trees come down and it's good wood, hardwood, not pine, that it goes to the recycling center and we give it to people in need because we have a, a human services officer here in town who works with folks who might need fuel assistance in the winter or, or maybe food assistance and we provide that. But we don't have wood and there's a lot of people in town who burn wood and a lot of, you know, the number of low income. And so we initiated that program. And now well, there's you know, our neighbor to neighbor group yes. goes and cuts and splits the wood and makes, right. it, makes it available. And that's I, why you're I, able to do it. I didn't realize it. <laughs> that, that, that would have started with you. Though. That's exactly where it came from. Yeah, um, then uh, when another gentleman was on the board, uh, a piece of land right next to the selectman's office um, came up for sale, but it was really foreclosed upon. And it was a piece of property where you couldn't get a septic system. It was a very small piece of property. If you look at the town offices and that piece of property directly to the right, it's a little triangle. Well, there's the town offices, you have to be 30 feet back from that. There's a brook that runs behind it, you have to be 50 feet from that. Then you have to be 30 feet back from the road. There was no place to put a septic system in. The bank had foreclosed on the property and was trying to sell it. So we went to the bank and said, you're gonna have a hard time selling it because you can't get a septic system in. And the septic system that is there now, we're pretty sure is leaching directly into the brook. So that's gonna be shut down. So the town would like to buy it, but we're not gonna pay what you're asking for. And I think we settled on a price of $40,000. Mm. So what that did was to take a piece of property Yes, it took it off the tax rolls, but it wasn't highly taxed because it was a substandard, should have been condemned in any other situation, piece of housing. It was, had been an old hunter's camp, I think, that people just kept three or four layers of linoleum on top of linoleum. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, a failed septic system. I, I truly think it was piping directly into the brook. And I, I'm very pleased that we ended up doing that because if we ever need more parking, we have area that but we also thought it's great to have a little sitting area we talked about getting a, a, some picnic tables and benches in there and that that didn't work out not yet but it could still happen mm -hmm. and then we also um, were able to get the uh, Trinity Church at the time that that the Clark Rockefeller <laughs> <laughs> there that was an interesting time to be a select you were on person the board then. oh absolutely I was yes, we yes. Uh, John Hammond and myself were interviewed by a number of national uh, TV, NBC, CBS, ABC uh, stations out of Boston about the whole Clark Rockefeller story. What did we know? What did we think? Yes, yes. Um, so once he um, was out of town and his wife divorced him and took all the property, which rightfully was hers anyway, it was her money, she offered the Trinity Church, just the way Peter Burling had, back to the town. And we were able to stand up in front of the 
the townspeople at town meeting and say, we lost the opportunity when Peter offered it. People didn't want it because it would just be an expense, but this is part of our history. And why would you ever sell your history, especially a building like that? And so now we have an opportunity to get it back. It's being offered by Clark's ex-wife. And I think we, we need to vote aye and take it back. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, once again, well, as long as it's not going to cost the town money. So we, we rent it out for weddings, that sort of thing. And I think it was a very wise decision that time the town voted yes. So I, I felt really good about that happening. All right, how about uh, disappointments? Well, the disappointments are generally the people that you encounter. Those are the only disappointments that mm -hmm. I had. And um, let me just put it this way. The day I was elected was a Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, there was a select board meeting. And when I walked in, the first female ever elected, um, no one said congratulations. They said hello. That was it. And then I was told that there's a tradition that all the new selectmen keep the minutes. And I was very doubtful about that. But I said, well, that's fine. I don't mind. I'm very good at keeping minutes. And anyway, the pen is mightier than the sword. So the minutes will be accurate when I keep them. They'll be complete and they'll be accurate because they were lacking. They were lacking sadly. You had no idea really what was going on if you read the minutes prior to that. So I wouldn't say that I was welcomed with open arms. And I thought that was very, very unfortunate. But from everything I'd heard about those kinds of changes, I wasn't encountering anything that someone else had not encountered in a similar situation. You know, I didn't realize that you were the first woman elected. You know, I've gone over the past minutes and I see the name, the name all males. Yes. But until today, I didn't realize that you were the first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Aren't you also now the secretary? Uh, am I wrong on that? Don't, for the, uh, for the town meetings? Oh, for school district meeting. Oh, now I'm right. Oh, that's school district. Right. Okay. So, so I, you know, I think I, I did my part. Nine years was a good run um, to be a select person. And I think it's really important that younger, and, but I understand the difficulty because of the time commitment. I would love to see 40 year olds do that job just because we need to bring people along and show them how it's done and get them to understand what it takes to operate a town. There's, there's a lot of, especially around tax time, going around to determine um, what the tax rate will be. That, that's a complicated process, and most people don't understand how the process works. And if you stop doing it for a couple of years, you begin to forget yourself. It's that complicated. But I would love to see more people try it. I would love to see, let's say it's retirees, I'd like to see more people run for office. It's an important job, and people who have administrative skills are the people that we need, but frequently they are not, they don't want to do it, you know, and it, so it really is, it's a volunteer job. You get paid a minimal amount, um, but it's still a volunteer job and it takes up a lot of time and you don't get paid for your weekends when you get phone calls because you will get phone calls when you're a selectman. Um, so I did that long enough and then I thought, well, I really do, I want to see the school uh, survive. I want to see the school thrive. And uh, I thought about running for a school board, but once again, there were plenty of people who were qualified to run. And I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll run for um, secretary. Uh, I thought that, that that was an important job, a job, the clerk. So it's school district clerk, really. But you are the secretary at the school district meeting. And I think keeping those minutes clear and keeping them complete is another important piece of work. And I, like I said, I'm pretty good at doing that, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we'd like to um, ask people that have lived here for a while about their views of Cornish of past and present. And the two things that have come up um, would be the roads and the uh, climbing school enrollment. Now, um, talk a little bit, you, you're a little later, people much older than you remember when the roads were really a, a right. difficult issue, right? right. right. Do you remember any, could you comment on the roads? I mean, you were on Deming Road, I mean, you were on off-road. Right, I was on a dirt road for a very long time. Yeah. Let me just say this, I now live on a paved road and <laughs> I don't think I'd go back to dirt. Yeah. Um, dirt roads are very difficult to maintain. There are so many weather conditions that affect how the roads function 
and the, the structure of the road, there are floods. We've seen the floods here in town where dirt roads will wash for miles and it's really expensive to build them back up. However, in the long run, they're cheaper to maintain. We have not um, paved any dirt roads that I'm aware of since 1971. We have not turned them to, uh, to uh, asphalt. And every now and then we talk about, should we unpave the roads? Should we rip the asphalt up everywhere in town and make everything go back to dirt? But I don't think there are very many people who would vote for that, but asphalt gets more and more expensive all the time. It's oil-based and we know what's happening to the price of oil. But I don't, for me, I haven't seen a big change. Every now and then somebody will say this was an awful year and the road agent didn't do a good job. Well, we fixed that too. That, that's another thing that we did. We made the, the road agent hired instead of voted was in. Was that during your time? Yeah, it was. And, and I think that was really, that was my last year in office was we pushed. Um, we had tried it one time before and everyone told us to be quiet, that they liked the idea of electing a road agent. And I, my, ex, my response was, well, I have a, at the time a 28 year old son who has no knowledge about roads but the way things stand right now, he could run for a road agent and he could win because people know him and like him. What's gonna to happen to the roads? Because he has no knowledge. In the 21st century, your road agent has to be an engineer, essentially, and has to have human resource background and has to have personnel management background and has to know how to budget. It's a complex job, it gets more complex all the time. So, and we've got, $200,000, $300,000 pieces of equipment so that the person who's the head of that department needs to have a lot of skill sets in their toolbox. Mm, I so yes. I think it's time to hire. Mm. And so we, we finally got that through. And my last year as select person, people voted. Those people who had said, not in my lifetime, changed their mind Raise and said, what, we think yeah. we understand yeah. now, no, yes. I think, I think the roads are money, well maintained. Oh, much older people remember when the machinery was different mm -hmm. and there were much more difficulties on the roads. Right, you know, but right. and the machinery was not as well built. We no. have a no. compacting vibrator right now so that when you go around and resurface the dirt roads, you put down hard pack, you can tamp it down and get it in place very quickly. Um, and we bought that machine, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that, and that was a good purchase. So we've got the equipment we need and as long as we have personnel and a manager in place who understands how to use it and what the roads need, what the engineering aspects are, we should be in good shape. Yeah. Now the other um, big change in Cornish has been the decline in school right. enrollment. Now, you're, you were here, you're, when your children were going to school, there were many more students. We had to put an addition on the school when my children were in school. When my youngest child was born was about the time we put the addition on. We needed a real gymnasium. We've been playing basketball in the town, the old town hall. And that was a concrete floor covered with linoleum. And my recollection of one of my last basketball games, and it was my youngest daughter, I was pregnant with my um, fourth child sitting right on the edge of the floor because there was no place for the spectators to sit. So you were up against the wall and here's the playing floor right in front of you and a basketball came shooting across the floor and hit me right in the acting. Well, I were pregnant this way, yes. were pregnant. No, I didn't realize, so actually they played basketball. Oh, and, and the floor yeah. would sweat. So it's in the cold months and so the floor would sweat and kids would slip and fall. It just wasn't suitable. It was time to, to build an addition and I think historically at that time and maybe even now, the only town in the country that took private funds to put an addition on a public school. We did not have a bond issue. We, George Edson spearheaded that and we raised private funds in town. Norm Chabot, who used to run Chabot's, which is now 12% solution, um, I think gave us $50,000 to kick it off which was really generous of him. I've been reading about that yeah. for the materials we had at the center. Right, yes. it was a yeah. fascinating time and it made yeah. national news. George used time. to go around with his model. Yes, you know, In this right. truck and, and they get people. Yeah. Yes. We we're yes. all very yeah. proud of that. Right. And now all of a sudden, there are two or three rooms that don't need to be used. Why do you think, uh, why do you think the enrollment has declined? Well, it goes round and round. I, I, I firmly believe that the town has become too expensive for 
young families with young children. It's very difficult to come into this town and buy a house um, that you can afford. Young families generally are making entry-level wage. Even if they are professionals, they are not in the mid-range or the high range of their, of their wage path. And so they can't afford a, an $800 a month or a $900, $1,000 a month mortgage payment. So they can't live here. And in order to be able to get a, a mortgage payment down that's, that they can handle, they'd have to have fifty dollars or $60,000 sitting in the bank as a down payment on the property. And I don't know too many 30-year-olds that can accumulate that kind of money with college debt, having children. So if you have two or three children and you move into town, where are you going to live? Then we have the, the zoning regulation where the majority of the town, you've got to have a minimum of five acres. So if you're going to buy five acres of land, the way it looks to me right now, some of those lots are going for anywhere from seventy to $100,000. Then you have to put in a septic system. You have to bring in electricity. Then you have to build a house. Once again, it's not affordable. So I think that we've priced ourselves out of the market for young families. That's where the kids are coming from. I was talking to um, Avatar, who's our appraisal company, works for the town of Cornish, to find out how many new houses have been built in Cornish in the last year even. And the person I spoke with couldn't remember for the last five years. He said, but I think in the last year, maybe one or two, but they're not being built by young families. They're being built on larger pieces of property by mm. re retirees. So we're becoming a community of retirees. Now I understand that all around the state, little communities like Cornish are experiencing this shrink. I'd like to know why other places are, are experiencing that. I know that demographically, the 20 something year olds are, don't have the jobs that they want. You know, So although we're so close to, to uh, Lebanon and we have so many startup companies there and you have a hypertherm, you have Dartmouth College, you have the hospital, some of our major employers. It seems to me that the employment opportunities are there, but the, the opportunity to buy a home or build a home isn't here. I think it's time that we look at our zoning and we think about expanding some of the village areas. Um, some people have suggested that. Um, some perhaps, uh, I mean, we all want to preserve open space. Sure. But some people have suggested perhaps some one acre zoning in a cluster setting. Sure. Some of what exists in Cornish Flat. Right. Well, no, it, the no, interesting thing no. to me is that Mill Village is the original village in Cornish. It was the first village. There were two mills here, a lumber mill and a grist mill. Um, it's where the first community started to develop that way. And yet when they set up zoning, they zoned Mill Village, at the time it was called rural residential, as five acre minimum lot size. Well, there's not five acre, five acre lots anywhere here, but if you go up Root Hill Road, which is at the end of the Mill Village Road, and on a bus route, there's plenty of land if you would break it down and make it village, just the way the flat is. Mm -hmm. The house across the street, my house, I could have a house next door to me. I'm not saying I want to, but I could. So you could increase the density here and it wouldn't affect anything. It's going to generate revenue because you're increasing density where roads already exist and are already maintained. So I don't want to see us increase the roads that we have to maintain, but certainly if we were to find ways to create some smaller lots around town, we might encourage younger people to come in. Mm. Because the way it's looking to me, that over 65 demographic keeps growing. So where in 2010, 65 and older made up about 12% of the population in Cornish, it's now closer to 16% and it's increasing, it's increasing because we're graying and no one's coming in. If I sold my house tomorrow, there's no young family that could afford to buy it. This is a beautiful home. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes. I've spent 20 years yeah. fixing it. <laughs> you know, uh, the other thing in terms of, 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 of zoning of land, land use uh, comes up, um, and Steve Taylor, you know, has, has, has mentioned this aspect of current use. Yes. And Steve has said that basically current use is a transfer of property tax. Um, 
do you have feelings or comments on that? Or um... I, I was always confused about how that transfer would work. So I think the transfer is indirect, it's not direct. If I had just open land and its fair market value was $100,000, but under current use it's assessed as 10000 and I'm only paying taxes on that $10,000 valuation, I thought that the state was looking at it as if it was $100,000 and asking the town, well, okay, you can, you can call it 10, but we know it's 100,000 and we want our share of that $100,000 valuation. That's not the case. If it's valued at 10, that's how the state sees it. So if we take, if it's a $500 tax bill, the town gets its percentage, the county gets its percentage of that 500 and the state gets its percentage. So no one's shifting directly onto your neighbor. But if you stop to think about it, if the town has to pay X number of dollars to the county and the state, um, perhaps your neighbors are going to pay a disproportionate share compared to what you're paying because you're somewhat protected. But I, the more I look at it, it's the land that's in current use. It's not the structure. And the structure carries a great deal of tax. So if you had $100,000 worth of land being taxed at 10000 but your house was a $500,000 house. So you'll pay 500 for the land, but you're gonna pay a heck of a lot more on the house. So there is a small shift on a secondary level to people who are not in current use. We don't get to protect our land, but the bigger value that I'm being taxed on isn't my land, it's my house. Mm -hmm. So the problem I have with current use is the difference between current use in Vermont and the difference between current use in New Hampshire. In Vermont, you have to have a minimum of 25 acres. In New Hampshire, it's 10. And in Vermont, their criteria for current use is a little more stringent. And so maybe we have to look at that and, and, and see if we're, if we're being smart about the way current use is being. I understand you want to preserve land. But there's quite a bit of land preservation in this town, and that's part of the problem. Mm. I bet 80% of the land between um, conservation easements and current use, um, there's not that much that you can build on. But when I bought 12 acres of land from my sister and her husband after I sold them the farm and then decided to build there, I was quite surprised to learn that I got hit with the change use tax. So I marched right into the selectman's office, mm. and Mike Savage was a selectman at the time, and I said, I need to understand why I'm getting a bill for $6,000. He said, because you took an acre of land out of current use. I said, I didn't take it out. My sister and her husband took it out when they subdivided the property. Seems to me that if you're going to get a benefit from a program, and you leave the program, the penalty should be to you. The person who has the benefit should pay the penalty. But no, the person who purchases it and pulls a permit to build, they're the ones that the town sees as you took it out of current use. Hmm. And so I, I have a real problem with that. Mm -hmm. And the real estate agent will say, it's okay, everybody knows that. Well, there was, I didn't know it. I didn't know I was gonna pay that tax, but you know that was 20 years ago. 30 years ago. So maybe now real estate agents are more careful to say, if you buy land that's coming out of current use, you're going to get hit with a penalty, 10% of the value. And then you can work that into the purchase and sale price. We've talked about um, declining enrollment in relation to land use. Let's get back to the, um, the future of the school system mm. in Cornish. Uh, what do you think the future is? It's really hard to say, and that's why I got involved, because I want us always to have a school. And there are times when I say, I wonder if that's possible. If, if families can't move or don't come here, don't have the financial capacity to buy here, where are the children going to come from? Will I have to give my house, and I suppose I could do that, give my house to my oldest grandson, who is 27 years old, um, do I give my house to him when I die so that he can come here and raise his children? What, what's happening? Is it that there aren't the jobs? Is it that that generation wants to be 
more urban, where my generation wanted to be more rural? Are we, are we seeing that flip-flop? Has the pendulum swung? There may be nothing that we can do, but I'm committed to holding on to the school as long as we possibly can. And I suppose if we came down to a population of 50, 55, somewhere in there, you'd have to admit that it's, it, we've swung back. I mean, think about population change. Civil War, we had, what, 1,700 residents here in town at the height, just before the Civil War was at um, 1840, I think. And then the lowest population was 1940. And now we have 1623, something like that, living in town. We still have not come back to the pre-Civil War population, but we are beginning to shrink. Are we going to go back to the way it was in 1940? And if we go back to that, which is a point in time when there were one-room schoolhouses, I don't think we'll ever go back to that. We'll do what some towns are doing already. We'll tuition out our elementary school kids, but that just seems a shame. Do you see any future? Uh, people have talked about frac uh, merger with Plainfield. Right. And, and, I, and, and that is an option, or Plainfield merge with us. Although Plainfield... So why does Plainfield have such a great population of students? and Cornish doesn't. What's the difference between Cornish and Plainfield that allows them to draw families in? Is it simply a mileage thing? People who work in Lebanon think that Cornish is too far south. Could that be why there are more families with kids in Plainfield? We need to understand that. If that's the case, then there's nothing we can do because people think we're too far away. Um, then, sure, then we would merge with Plainfield. I don't think Plainfield would ever come this way just because they have the population. Their population is shrinking too, but not yes. as badly as ours. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's places like Lyme, where the population in the school is growing in leaps and bounds, but that's because those folks who work at Dartmouth College or DHMC can't afford to buy in Hanover, so they're going to Lyme, and so their kids are there. So young families with limited funds go where houses are affordable. Probably Lyme is not that much farther away than Cornish just from Hanover. Well, it? that's what I think. I mean, I mean, so we need to look at that. So what's the difference between the two towns? Why are we not able to bring young families in here? Interesting. But and and it, it's probably affordability as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. So then how do we affect that? Well, by getting a housing stock that's going to be affordable, by building more houses. And in order to do that, you need to be able to have smaller lot sizes. Interesting. I mean, I don't want us to look like Long Island. That's well, where my husband was from. <laughs> <laughs> I get that all the time because yeah. I'm originally from New Jersey. Okay, know. so yeah. we know yeah. we know what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, yes. And, uh, but there's but there's a middle ground. You yes, know? absolutely. One absolutely. acre, yeah. one acre should be fine anywhere. There's I mean, of open space. Sure, yeah. one acre is a lot of open space between houses. Yeah. I grew up in Barrington, Rhode Island, which was considered not urban, but it was well outside of Providence. And we, we lived on lot sizes that were pro much bigger than Long Island. Um, maybe a half acre, a little less than a half acre. And Long Island, what, what is it, a quarter of an acre, an eighth of an acre? I mean, they really chop it up. Um, and we don't want to have to have infrastructure for that, like in the flat. We don't want to have to have water treatment, city water, city sewer. We don't want to do any of that. And I, and I believe that the... The way the flat's defined right now, it's as compact as it can get. But when they did zoning and planning, when the first zoning regulations were introduced into the town, what those planners did was to draw a circle around what existed. And they said, okay, that's village. They didn't give any room for expansion. They locked it in. I think it's time to revisit that. Maybe we need to expand that line out a little bit. Maybe we need to look at village um, zoning here, lot size of an acre, setback of 10 feet instead of 30 feet. We need to look at that. And right now we're not even looking at it. People are happy. And that's another thing. People, if the majority of people are happy the way it is, it's not going to change. And then we're going to continue to see the population decline until there's no school. But I'm one of those people. I have four children. I have eight grandchildren. I think kids are wonderful. I don't ever want to be in a town where there are no children. Even when Aiden, who is my youngest grandchild in uh, third grade, I love going to school, like a lot of grandparents, 
and sitting through all those performances and watching them mess up lines or sing out of tune and just go home smiling. Even if I had no children in the school, I would still like to go and watch that. I think that's a wonderful part of life. I don't, I don't want to see us be a gray town. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> well, Marilyn, um, I think I finished with the questions that I wanted to ask, but um, is there anything we didn't cover or anything that you would like to add uh, at the end? Uh, I, I think the only thing I would add is when we discovered Cornish in 1971, it was a paradise, a true paradise. I think it still is, and I think it still can be, even if we change things just a little bit. Um, paradise needs a healthy community, and I think a healthy community includes children. So I want to see that happen. I left Cornish for a few years after Eddie's death and had opportunities to go anywhere and came back here, and more and more, I say this was the right move. It's, it, there's no place like Cornish and, and the Upper Valley. We're very lucky when you see what went on today in Las Vegas, when you see the hurricanes and the weather changing and the destruction in the Caribbean where I went for a few years, I say, boy, did I make the right move, you know. Fate just moves you along sometimes mm -hmm. and you end up ending up where you should be all along. And as I said, my husband and I looked at this house a long time ago and here I and am now. And I'm, yeah. I'm quite yeah. happy. I moved a lot in my life. I've been here 20 years and I was recounting to my children how many times I moved with my parents, how many times I moved after getting married. And I said, I've never been in a house more than six years at a time until I came here. Hmm. This was the longest 20 years. And so it, it, it finally feels like home. <laughs> it really does. I expect I'll be here a long time. Longevity runs in the family. So if they want to come back and interview me when I'm 90, my, horse, my, my voice will be a little more hoarse, <laughs> but I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, Cornish is a great place, a great, great place. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, very informative for me. <laughs> my pleasure. And, uh, and I enjoyed it very much. And at the end of every interview, I always uh, look at Billy and say, uh, well, Billy, this is a take. Thank you. <laughs>